Amen. May that be our prayer and a prayer that the Lord answers this morning. If you just remain standing, I'm going to read just one verse. The next verse we're at in 1 Peter chapter 3, it simply goes like this, and then I'll pray. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. This is the word of God. Lord, indeed, speak, O Lord. Speak into our hearts, O God. You are the living God. This is your living word. Spirit of God, build your church. Help us. Enable us to walk in your ways as you walk with us. And so we pray in faith, knowing that you love us in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you. It's been said that uh, the people we love the most, we can hurt the most. And of course, the reverse is also true. Some of the worst pain that some of you have felt has come from people that uh, you most loved. And marriage is one of those relationships, of course, in which this can, this can take place. Uh, but Peter is not speaking about marriage simply as a concept or a marriage in the whole, if you would. Peter addresses wives and husbands <clears throat> in a larger framework. And I want us to understand that again. It's been three weeks since we've been in 1 Peter. And that might help you understand why he emphasizes what he emphasizes and why he leave certain things out. And so I remind you that Peter has been writing to believers in the first century who were going through very severe and difficult times because of their faith. And he was teaching them and also teaching us uh, how to live as the people of God in a high, hostile setting, in a hostile culture. And what he taught them and he teaches us is, first of all, we need to live out of our Christian identity. That's the positive thing he said to them, that remember, whatever the world thinks of you, whatever the, however the world labels you as a Christian, uh, remember who you are in the eyes of God because of what he's done for you. You are his child. You are a living stone being built upon the cornerstone. He said to them in chapter 2, verse 9, you're a chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, God's own possession. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you, were, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we live out of our identity in Christ, and this identity leads, if I put it this way, negatively to the fact that as a result, we don't longer always fit into this world. Verse 11, the next verse, he says, you are sojourners in this world. You are, you are exiles in this world now. He doesn't mean geographically, I mean wherever you live, he says spiritually, you're, you don't fully fit here any longer. Our citizenship, our primary citizenship is in heaven, not in any one nation here on this earth. And our lives are shaped by our Lord and his word and not, and not by the culture. And inevitably, this leads, to, this leads to pain and mistreatment by the world. And nevertheless, we are to continue doing good deeds before the world. He says, live honorable lives, verse 12, chapter 2, that they, as they observe you, even though they speak evil of you, the indication was some may come to give glory to God on the day of visitation. And nevertheless, this will involve being treated unjustly by some who will not give glory to God. And we are to understand that as the children of God, as the people of God in this world, we are on some level to trace the footsteps of Christ in his sufferings. And his sufferings were unjust. At times that means that we will, as the people of God, have to defer being treated justly here. To defer it, not demand it. 
for the sake of his name. And Jesus set that example for us even all the way to the cross. Chapter 2, verse 21 says, To this you have been called, what? Suffering. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself and the circumstances, we said, to him who judges justly. And we are to follow God in that way. <clears throat> At times, that'll be what God calls us to do. But we do not do this in our own strength. One of the evidences of possessing this new life, of being a genuine Christian, of having been born again of the imperishable word, as he said earlier, is the fact that we have a capacity to endure with hope, to live out of hope in this hostile culture. Because when Christ died, he didn't die just as a moral example. He died to achieve to achieve and gain our salvation, which includes the new birth and the gift of the Holy Spirit. In verse 24, he went on to say, chapter 2, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. And to borrow the language of Paul in Romans 6, he says, when his death was your death, <laughs> his resurrection was your resurrection. You have died to sin, meaning sin's control, it's absolute bondage, and you are now alive to God, alive to righteousness. And so following the steps of Christ, however arduous it may be at times in suffering unjustly, is evidence of this new life that God has given us. And as we follow the Lord, we will be treated unjustly by those whom God has called us to show honor, to submit to their authority. And the general principle was stated in verse 13. He said of chapter 2, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Verse 17, honor everyone, that is, show honor to whom Honor is due. And in some cases, this involves submission. That's the overarching admonition that uh, Peter has been unfolding now for a little while. And he applied it in three spheres of life. Uh, he said, as citizens, we are to honor and submit to the governors. As servants, household servants, to their masters, or we would say today, perhaps the workplace, right? And then lastly, that's why he talked about marriage. In chapter 3, verse 1, as wives to your husbands, even unbelieving husbands. Chapter 3, verse 1, this is where we were three weeks ago. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, meaning some of these may even be unbelievers, he didn't say they all are, they may be one, that is, one to Christ, one to the faith, without a word, he says, by the conduct of their wives. And that's where uh, we left off last week, verses 1 through 6, where he addresses the wife. Now, I didn't mention this in this way, but I think it's good to emphasize it at this point, that one of the general principles that Peter has been fleshing out here we looked at it, but not stated this way, is this. Seeing unbelievers come to Christ is a greater cause than demanding justice for ourselves. Now, for ourselves, not, not for others. This is a personal decision. At certain places in your life, you know, maybe in the workplace, maybe in relation to uh, 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 some association you belong to, but even in marriage, a mixed marriage of believing wife and unbelieving husband. Say it again. Seeing unbelievers come to Christ is such an eternal thing. Life, eternal. Avoiding the condemnation of God. That is a greater cause than demanding justice for ourselves. 
And so he applied that. In essence, what he was doing was applying that to every sphere of life. And then he applied it to wives of unbelieving husbands. And then he addresses husbands, which is interesting. Because when he addressed citizens, he didn't address governors. And when he addressed servants, he didn't address their masters. But when he addressed wives, he does address husbands. He doesn't tell us why, but perhaps because of the level of permanence and intimacy of that relationship and its foundation to uh, society. And perhaps knowing there were many believing husbands there, he didn't want to leave the subject untouched. We're not sure why, but he does address them. In what sense that he, does he address them? Look at how verse 7 began. Likewise, husband. Likewise. In what sense, likewise? In the same way as wives, likewise, submit? No, I don't think so. This is a loose connection. Nowhere does the Bible address the husband directly and say, submit to your wife. I think the likewise here is to the larger principle of honor. Show honor to all, to whom honor is due. For some, that's submission. And for husbands, yes, there's a place for you to honor in marriage. And that's honoring your wife. And so I think that's why he goes into uh, uh, addressing the husband, why he says, likewise. Here's how husbands show honor, to whom honor is due. In the context of marriage, that honor is due to your wife. So what is Peter teaching us here? If we were to just sum up verse 7, what is he getting across? He's teaching us how Christian husbands are to honor their wives as a testimony to an unbelieving world uh, so that they may have an effective prayer life. Do you notice that last phrase? So that your prayers may not be hindered. <laughs> So let me say again, what's Peter, get, what's his point here? What's he teaching us? How Christian husbands are to honor their wives as a testimony to the unbelieving world. That's the context here. So as to have an effective prayer life. Now, just as we did three weeks ago and we spoke to wives and we said, not all of you are wives, not all of you are women, not all of you are married. And now we're addressing husbands. Not all of you are husbands, not all of you are married, but there is an application to us all. Why? Because Peter does what he, here, what he does in many places is he's making a specific application of a larger principle. And I think he's act actually anticipating verse 12 where he's going. Because in verse 12, he once again returns to Psalm 34, which evidently was shaping much of Peter's thinking in this whole letter. He quotes Psalm 34, just a few verses down, verse 12, and he says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. And so there's the larger principle. What is it? There is some connection between an effective prayer life and how we live, how we relate to others. And so that might be the way you might listen to this as you make your, we make our way through this. But let's speak directly to husbands because that's what Peter's doing here. And there are two primary duties that are set up grammatically in this one verse. And it's these two present participles. The first one is living with, and the second one is showing honor. But the present tense implies this is something that ought to be ongoing in the marriage. So the first duty is husbands, live with your wives. Now, you might say, well, duh, I hope they live together. I mean, no, it's not so basic as that. He doesn't mean make sure you have the same mailing address. That, that's not what Peter is getting at. The word means to dwell together, to cohabit, and it implies a level of intimacy. Uh, in, the, in, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew, it's used often to refer to sexual intimacy in marriage, the marriage bed. I think Peter includes that, but he's using it in a broader sense. He's speaking of a broader oneness, a broader togetherness that includes uh, the marital bed, uh, uh, sexual intimacy as well. 
You go back to Genesis 2.24, and you read there, it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. You got to move out, guys. <laughs> For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave. There's the, the word, cleave to his wife, cohabit. And it's talking about a, 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 a companionship. And the two shall become one flesh. One flesh sexually, yes, but one flesh in every way. That's what we should be seeking emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. In other words, this is a all-encompassing companionship. And men are called, the husbands are called to cultivate that. He's not just talking about having the same address, right? And of course, this involves the physical aspect of our lives together. Daniel Doriani in his commentary says, it tears, it tears the fabric of a marriage when a husband and wife deprive each other of physical love. And that's why Paul warns against that in 1 Corinthians. But not even just uh, the uh, marital bed, but it tears at a marriage when a we are deprived of even that, that simple touch of love, that embrace of love, that hug, that affirmation, that back rub, that, that I love you message that comes physically. And so husbands, uh, uh, the, what Peter's saying is you're called to promote a mental, spiritual, and emotional oneness in your marriage, not just have the same mailing address, because you can live, and I've seen this many times, a husband and wife can live in the same house and, and be totally uh, worlds apart, <laughs> completely separate, live as complete strangers with the same mailing address, separate space, separate pursuits, separate televisions, meals at different times, you know, one goes to the garage, guess which one that is, and the other one goes to her safe place, you know, somewhere else, somewhere else in the house. Uh, what he's saying is you need to cultivate, work at cultivating intimacy in the marriage relationship, dwell together, become one flesh in every way, and the responsibility to see that deepen over time is upon the husband. Uh, and so that involves, and I, I hate to say it, all these guys looking at me, it, it involves communication. <laughs> you got to move past grunts. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere beyond grunts and shoulders going, you know. <laughs> Some guys, that's all they can do, you know? <laughs> you know, it's like, read my body language, honey. You know, that's it. Uh, it involves what? Words. <laughs> it involves communication. With words we can tear down, James says, or words we can build up, right? We can edify. And it's in our fallenness that men tend, I guess, some way to be less, tend to be less communicative with their wives about the things that they feel, the way they are struggling maybe, and so forth, and not try to understand their wives as well and communicate. So it involves that. You need to cultivate that. And so that's the, that's the verbal idea here. The verbal idea is living together, right? Dwelling together. And then he, he says that you should do that in a specific manner. He says, dwell with your wife in an understanding way. And, and that, that phrase there, in an understanding way, is our English translator's attempt to make sense of an awkward phrase in the, in the original text, the Greek language, which is, according to knowledge. According to knowledge. I've yet to read a Valentine card that says, my love, I love you according to knowledge, you know. She says, what, what's, what's this, you know? What, do you read the encyclopedias, <laughs> you know? What do you mean, according to knowledge? And so our English translators try to bring across what they think the idea is, which is, in a you know, according to a consideration of her in an understanding way. But knowledge is the key idea here. But the knowledge of what? Well, it certainly involves knowing her, and I'm going to go there in a moment, but in what Peter's been saying, he's contrasting the knowledge they have now in the light of Christ, under the light of the gospel, 
in comparison to the ignorance, and that's the word he uses in chapter 1, verse 14, the ignorance of their previous life. Chapter 1, 14, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. You were led by your, your sin and your passions, and you evaluated life and marriage, sex. You evaluated everything ignorant of God, ignorant of God's truth, ignorant of Christ, of the gospel, grace, all of those things, you see. And now you need to love your wife. Not according to the way your flesh led you before. Not according to the, the passions of the world. Not according to Hollywood. You can't objectify your wife. You got to leave all that behind. And you need to love her and, and cherish her. And you need to live with her through the lens. Through the lens of God's truth. And what God says about her, what God says about love, what God says about marriage, what God says about your sexuality, what God says about headship in the home, all those things. There needs to be a change here. You were ignorant before, but now you should love her according to the knowledge of the truth. Which implies that Peter believed that the husbands he was addressing were Christians. And these were things they ought to know. So know, know her through the lens of the truth of God and what God says about all things regarding relationships, but also know her in an understanding way, according to knowledge, the knowledge of truth. And I suppose it, it has to involve knowing her. You know, Paul has a different emphasis. Remember, Paul's talking about marriage in a different context as Peter. And so Paul says, husbands' uh, main duty is to love their wives as Christ loved the church in Ephesians chapter 5. But both love and companionship, which is what Peter's talking about, deepening this intimacy, both love and deepening this intimacy are, are inextricably linked, and both of those are based fully upon what? Knowledge. Both knowledge about what God says, but also knowledge of the other person. How can you serve someone if you don't know them? Don't know what their deepest needs truly are. Don't know why, why they are struggling as they are. And so it's know your wife, know her. Uh, how else could you help her? We are to love as Christ loved the church. And he, what did he do? He, he gave his life. He sacrificed himself. But he also loved the church according to knowledge. And what do I mean by that? The one who has loved you the most is the one who knows you the most, and that is Christ Jesus. When he went to the cross to bear your wrath, he went knowing your rejection. He went knowing your sins. He went knowing everything about you, and not just knowing in his deity, shall we say, you know, he's as the son of God, he's omniscient and so forth, but he went as your brother, knowing what struggles you have. What do I mean? What I mean is the eternal Son of God, the Word, became flesh. He became flesh, and He dwelt among us. He walked where you and I walked, and He knows what rejection feels like as a human being. He knows He shed tears. He was, re he was abandoned by people who were His closest friends. He was hurt. He was accused of being an, a, a servant, an instrument of the devil. Uh, he knew what it was to be tired. He knew what it was to thirst. Oh, yes. He loves you, knowing you, according to knowledge. And that's why we run to him, right? He was made like us in every way, the book of Hebrews says, apart from sins, in order that he might become a, a, a faithful high priest who understands us. Then later in Hebrews chapter 4, I just quoted chapter 2, and chapter 4 says, we do not have a, a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. 
but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows the power of temptation, and he knows it better than you, because he resisted it and never gave in to it. He says, let us then with confidence draw near, you know, draw near, draw near to the throne of grace. In other words, because he knows us so well, and we and you understand that, that he fully understands your frailty as a human being, your difficulties, your pains, your struggles, your loss, that you can be assured that when you go to him, you're not going to get a grunt or a shrug or a, I just don't understand you. <laughs> what you get from him is that comprehensive embracing sympathy and empathy of having walked in your place. So husbands, as we know our wives, know her, know what she's like and so forth, that will build a confidence in her wanting to come to you uh, for that counsel, that input, that uh, the place to lean upon and cry and know that you understand her. That's part of it there. Know her, know the little things, yeah, but I don't think Peter's talking about the little things, though at times they're important because they help build the relationship, you know, know the favorite colors, favorite this, favorite food, and likes and dislikes, things like that, uh, but deeper things, you know. Know what really, really causes her to struggle. Know what really breaks her heart. Know her weaknesses, her spiritual deficiencies in Christ, like yours, so you can edify her and build her up. You know, know her. Know her. Go beyond uh, the superficial. Uh, and in our, um, in our uh, class, in our discipleship, when we, we touch on marriage, which is why we encourage everyone to go through a discipleship, one of the areas we touch on is marriage. We start talking with husbands. And one of the things I like to say to the guys is, listen, your wife is a moving target. So you are what? A lifelong learner, right? Some of you guys are laughing because you know we talked about this. What she liked at 25, she may detest at 35. <laughs> and you got to keep up. You got to understand where she's going. You have to understand that as she matures and changes in life or their struggles, you've got to keep up with what's happening here. It's, it's not a set it and forget it, you know? And you know you blew it when you walk in the room with something like, here's your rose. And she looks at it like, you ought to know for the past 10 years I've told you I hate roses, you know? But she's so kind, she won't say that. <laughs> she just rolls her eyes, you know? Clueless. <laughs> is what she's saying with her body language, you know. But nevertheless, that's what we are. We're lifelong learners. Um, know her fears and deepen that companionship. Dwell together. Not just live in the same house. <laughs> Dwell together. Go deeper, husbands. Cultivate that. And the second verbal idea, he says, is show honor. Showing honor. Verse 7. Back to our text, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. And so we're going to look at what all that says there. But he says, showing honor to the woman. And the idea of honor is a word we've seen already, a respect, to show the value of this person. Uh, it has been translated preciousness. So show, demonstrate her value to you because of her value to God. And cherish her as being precious. And this was, uh, this would have been totally countercultural on many levels in Peter's first century, Gre century Greco-Roman context. You know, men could run, husbands could run roughshod over their wives with society's full approval in the first century. In that context, there was no such thing as... Uh, Restraining orders. Nothing like that. And so he's saying, you need to honor your wife. Scripture says, yes, 
Scripture says you have different roles and you are the head of your wife as Christ is the head of the church, as Father is the head of Christ. But that doesn't give you a license to be a despot. That doesn't give you a license to bark commands and to crush her spirit and to rule over her and so forth. So show the, the preciousness of her and demonstrate honor to her. Colossians 3.19 says, love your wives, Peter, and he says, do not be harsh with her. Now, the idea here is not just how you think of her, but how you show it. In fact, the verbal idea is showing, <laughs> showing honor, not, but I feel like I love her. <laughs> no, show it. <laughs> but I, th I think she's precious to me. Show it. <laughs> Demonstrate it. The whole idea is to show it, bring it out. It must reach her. It must come out of here and touch her. Showing honor, it's done in words and actions. Douglas Wilson in his book on marriage says, there's no such thing as an invisible honor or respect. <laughs> if, if you don't show it, you don't have it. You don't, you're not honoring, you're not respecting. It has to be shown. There's no th such thing as invisible honor and respect. These things are expressed again with words and our, our actions, but it does start with words, affirming words, words that edify and build up. Um, in Proverbs 31, which we read three weeks ago of the, you know, the Proverbs 31 godly woman, it also speaks of the husband there. In Proverbs 31, verse 28 says, her children rise up and call her blessed. So they're speaking. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. And this is what he says. Many women have done excellently, but you surpass them all. Has anything anywhere near words like that ever come out of your lips? She needs affirmation. She needs affirmation in her role especially. You know, in the culture in which our wives live, they are constantly beat down for, their, for maintaining this conviction of what God desires for a woman and a wife to be. And when they go out in the world, what they see, what they read, what they hear, and sometimes from their friends, they are mocked for viewing marriage in this way. They need to come home and not just here. Is dinner ready? Where's my socks? Grunt. She needs the affirmation that you recognize that she is seeking, striving that inner, for that inner beauty of a woman in Christ. Honor her. Affirm her communicate, reinforce her, and especially in front, if you have children, in front of children, honor her by standing with her before the children. And if you have a disagreement, dismiss the kids <laughs> and then take time to talk about the disagreement quietly. But you stand behind her and, and affirm her. Uh, so do this, honor your wives, show honor, uh, and do it while recognizing two things about her, her inequality to you and her equality with you. These are two different things, and we need to balance them and know how to keep them together. Re honor her by recognizing her inequality. What do I mean by that? Look what he says, back to our text again, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. There's the inequality. Now, Peter does not state in what way he is meaning that she is the weaker vessel. What might he be meaning? 
certainly not morally weaker. Men and women in Christ have the potential of the same potential of growth in the Holy Spirit. No, not morally weaker. No. Intellectually weaker? No. Men and women of high intellect are, uh, live in this church. Or, uh, both are highly educated in our culture and so forth. How about emotionally? I know some tend to think, well, maybe he's talking about the fact that she's emotionally a weaker vessel. Listen, they may express their emotions more and be more open and more communicative, but that doesn't make her weak. In fact, it, you, your weakness may be that you can't express emotion. <laughs> You, you struggle with understanding her emotions and so forth. So no, she's not intellectually weaker. She's not morally weaker. She is not uh, spiritually weaker. I don't think he's talking about any of those things. But he's saying, I want you to honor your wife as a woman. And I think that's where some of our understanding of what he's getting at. Because the word he uses for woman, very interesting, is not the word in the original text that is normally used for woman or wife. It is a form which only appears here in the New Testament, and that is a word that's translated a f- the feminine one. So love her as a woman. Honor her as a woman, as the feminine one. And so in a sense, Peter is stressing something about uh, her femininity, you see. And he wants us to recognize that. He is simply noting what the world fails to understand now, that there is a difference between male and female. (laughs) That there are such things as masculinity and femininity. Do you know that a student in a Catholic high school in Canada last week was first expelled for standing up and saying, quoting scripture in a Catholic school and saying, no, there are only two genders, male and female, he created them. And so he was expelled. And when he came back to school, he was publicly arrested. That's where our culture is going and is in many circles. God forbid these people are given absolute power. So Peter says, love her as the feminine one. Honor her as the feminine one. Affirm her. Show honor. And again, just to bring you all back in, this is not just something that that applies to husbands because this is a specific application of a broader principle. In the book of Romans, in chapter 12, Paul says to the whole church, verse 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. And here it is, outdo one another in showing honor. There's the same words, showing honor. The church is to outdo each other in showing honor, respect, and the preciousness of what a brother or sister in Christ is. So what he tells husbands is just a specific application of that. But he says you do it in a manner that recognizes her, her femininity as the weaker vessel. But I want to keep exploring what he means by that. First of all, notice that it is a comparative statement. He says, weaker vessel. And that implies a couple of things. First of all, it implies what Peter's saying is both the husband and the wife are vessels. You're both vessels. You're both, as we saw last week, the same word in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. You're just a jar of clay, right? You are vessels of God, but you're both weak. You're human. You're frail. You get tired. You sin. You blow it. You're finite. You're both weak vessels. She is the weaker vessel. So that's a comparative statement there. So we're back to, well, what is he getting at in this comparative uh, statement here? Again, on one level, he is speaking of the differences in genders. And it may be simply on one level the physical differences, no matter what our culture says, no matter what laws Congress may pass to try to dissolve gender distinctions, it is just an inescapable biological fact that men and women are different. It may be on one level he's saying, 
because men tend to be stronger because of our physical makeup, tend to be, generally speaking, this is a way of reminding the men you aren't to throw your weight around in the home. There's no room for abuse. We already looked at that three weeks ago from the other side of the coin. So on one level he's saying, he might be simply saying that, honor her, cherish her, be tender with her, do not be throwing your weight around and your physicality in the home. That has nothing to do with how you lead as a servant that is Christ-like. So he may be touching on that, but I think Peter's talking broader than this, and this is why I think so, and as, as scholars, other scholars go in, in, in the same direction, is that his context is what? Peter's writing to people who are in vulnerable positions under authority. Right. And they might suffer the abuse of that power, the abuse of that authority, and so Peter addresses now the husband, and he's saying to her, remember now, she is in the weaker position in the home in marriage. As well as society, for sure. In other words, for her to have her conscience clear before God, she has to submit to you. Do not take advantage of that. Don't you crush her with that. Don't you wave the I'm the head of the house flag. Don't abuse this. She's in the weaker position as the two vessels. I think largely that's probably what he's emphasizing. In the world that you and I live, as well as the world in which Peter lived, the strong take advantage of the weak. The strong crush the weak. And the weak are forced to honor the strong. That's the way the world works. But the, the gospel so transforms us in Christ, in the church, and in marriage. Honor goes in both directions. The weak will honor the strong, but the strong must honor the weak. Because what? She's also an heir with us in ways she is equal to you, right? She's an heir of that grace of life that is in Christ Jesus. Paul used that analogy. Remember when he, he spoke of the Christian church as a human body? And he says the human body has different parts and some that are less honorable than others, you know? Some parts we keep covered, he says, than other parts. And, and he uses that hum, human body analogy to talk about the church and how we are to relate to one another, the strong, the weak, and so forth. I'll quote him directly, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 23. On those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. Hmm. The strong must throw, bestow greater honor on those which appear weak. Why? Because the strong will always appear to be honored. And so you honor the weak. He says, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So Paul says that in the church, honor goes in both directions. There'll be those like Paul and Apollos and others who are public, and there'll be this sort of honor given to them that's natural. He says, but God wants us to show greater honor on those everyone tends to overlook. That's what he says, in the body and in the marriage. It's the same. The strong must not take advantage of the weak in Christian marriage. And this is possible only because of this new life we possess in Christ Jesus. That a church of people could do this, you know. I was imagining the first century churches, that some of the ones that Paul and Peter visited, where a slave could be an elder in the church over the master uh, who was a member of the church. You see. That only happens in the gospel <laughs> only happens in the grace of God when he creates his people a people for his own 
possessions. So husband, don't abuse your authority. Honor her, keeping in mind, recognizing her inequality. I'm calling it functional because of the, the way it functions in the home, but also recognizing her spiritual equality, right? He goes on to say, since they are heirs, this is a reason to do that, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. The grace of life being an heir is pointing forward to what that inheritance he said in chapter one we have. Her inheritance is the same as yours. The glory of God's going to be revealed. She's going to share it. What Christ gained for you the cross, the future glory he gained for her as well. She's your sister. She's a child of grace. So you r- relate to her on that level as well. And use your leadership recognizing that about her. Know that about her. You know, though the Bible says that there are different roles in marriage that does not in any way imply inferiority or superiority. And the model for us is God himself, the Holy Trinity. God the Son is co-equal, co-eternal. He is is co-existent with the Father. And yet he, what, submits to the Father. The economic aspect of the Trinity. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my Father. There's no equality between the Son and the Father, but there's order. And so there is in the home as well. We have different roles. There's a positional inequality. But when it comes to our standing before God, you and your wife are just as valuable and precious to Him. You were purchased with the same price. So cherish her in that light. As Paul says, Galatians 3, there's no male or female, no rich or poor, there's no slave, right, or free In Christ Jesus, spiritually speaking, we stand under the same gospel. He says these things to the men, the husbands. Lastly, he says, do this, do this so that your prayers may not be hindered. And that comes across as somewhat of a surprising ending, doesn't it? In other words, he ends all this with warning, (laughs) a warning. Indeed, so that your prayers may not be hindered. The word hindered is a military word. It means, it was, it means to cut something off, thwarted, like it was used of roads being cut off so enemies couldn't advance or, or supply lines being cut off. He's saying, honor your wife, cherish her, love her, recognize her frailty in the structure God has given to marriage. Don't abuse it. And he says, if you do, your prayers may be cut off. It may be hindered, may be thwarted in some way. Um, now, what does he mean by this? Well, some, some think that because the, the your there is plural, he's talking about their joint prayers. In other words, your husband and wife prayers together will be hindered. Well, yeah, that is absolutely true. When, there, when If there's all conflict in the home, you, you rarely pray together. <laughs> Uh, But I don't think that's what he's saying here. I don't think he's saying your joint prayers will be hindered. That is true. But I don't think that's what Peter's saying because he's, he's addressing husbands plural. He's speaking directly to the husbands of these churches. And so he says your prayers, husbands, plural, will be hindered. It presumes that these husbands are what? Praying. (laughs) It presumes they understand as shepherds of their home, they ought to be praying. And he says, your prayers as a husband will be hindered if you do not keep these things in mind. So how do we understand this idea of be hindered? And I got to admit, it was tough. And 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 I'm not sure I'm entirely done. Next week is verse 12, right? Where he quotes Psalm 34. So I got another week here. Uh, but best I understand, when he says your prayers are hindered, I think he's only talking about two possible things. One, the effectiveness of your prayers, and that's the hardest one to understand. And the other one is the practice of your prayers. Right? Your prayer life is hindered when your marriage is a mess. So both, it's, it's either one or both of those is hard to understand. The first one, 
I don't think we should understand if we say your prayers are hindered. And that word, and by the way, that verb is in a passive form, meaning uh, it probably means God is hindering him. God's cutting him off. Uh, I don't think we should understand this as meaning that marital struggles will cut you off from God. It's impossible. We cannot be cut off from God. Our standing with God is saved. Notice he says your prayers are hindered, not your relationship with God is hindered, or your progress with God, uh, uh, his love for you is hindered. No, no, no. He says your prayers are hindered. That's all he's talking about, is prayers somehow being hindered. And so... I think there is biblical grounds for saying, and without explaining the why, but the what is there, and the what is this, that if we don't love those we're supposed to call to love, and we cherish hatred in our heart or sin, that God doesn't listen to all our prayers. It begins that way in Psalm 66, verse 18. And this is a truth, apparently, that moves over also from Psalm 34 into the New Testament. Psalm 66, verse, uh, I'll read verse 17 and 18. 17 says, I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. And here comes the contrast. If I had cherished iniquity, cherished it, held on to sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And then Peter quotes in verse 12, 1 Peter 3, from Psalm 34, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Some mystery to this, but I think that Paul is saying you can't, I mean, Peter's saying you cannot ignore your wife and treat her wrongly and expect God to care about your prayers. Something to that effect. Uh, Charles Biggs in the ICC commentary says, the size, the size of the injured wife come between the husband's prayers and God's hearing. Well, the why and how all that's, I don't know. <laughs> it, we're not told much, but it, basically we're seeing here a principle. There is a connection between how we live and the effectiveness of our prayers. Now, for sure, the second way he may be talking about this is that the practice of prayer is hindered. Your prayers are hindered in many ways, you see. Your prayer life, the practice, right, uh, is hindered. When a husband fails to be kind and gentle to his wife and lives, lives for himself and fails to recognize and appreciate that she is his sister in Christ and a fellow heir of the grace of God, saved by grace, if you, when you fail to think like that, live like that, several things happen. One of them, your own heart grows cold towards God and spiritual truth, spiritual realities. Why? Because you're already close to, cold to the fact that she's your sister. You're already cold to the fact that she was bought by the blood of Christ. You don't seem to care about that. You're willing to crush her. And so it becomes, what? It becomes hard to pray about deep truths. Why? Because evidently you don't care about deep truths. And you're moving further and further away from gospel core truths and, and, and realities. You start becoming spiritually distant from God. And this is a spiritual principle. It's biblical. If you don't love those whom God says you ought to love, which are your brothers, how can you say you love God? That's what it says in 1 John 4, 9. The, the Apostle John said that. 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, that's a brother in Christ we're talking about. And this would apply here. Sister, your wife. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother, sister. So if you do not cherish your wife, you do not love her as you call to love her, you do not show her honor, what John is saying you will become more distant from God, to be sure, because how you become a hypocrite. How can you say, oh, I love God, and I want to pray about deep things for this person and this and that, when you don't even love the one he's placed right next to you? 
So that's one of the things that happens. Your, your prayer life suffers in that way. And your prayer life also suffers because you start spiraling down and spiraling down into deeper and deeper false piety, hypocrisy, inauthenticity. It's hard to ask for mercy when you show none. It's hard. It's, it's hypocrisy to ask for mercy and compassion when you show little of it, you see. And so I think Peter is touching on these things to be sure. The other one's harder to understand. But this one is clear in Scripture. Husbands, when you fail to honor your wife as God has called you to, your prayer life is going to suffer. It's going to slowly fall apart and disintegrate. Well, beloved, the Lord wants us to live in this hostile culture with hope. Out of hope, built of our identity, who we are in Christ, out of hope of our inheritance. And he wants our families, he wants our marriages to display the goodness of his design before the world, the blessedness of his design before the world. And he wants our prayer lives to be effective, right? And Spurgeon once says, anything is a blessing which makes us pray. <laughs> And so if today, if today this admonition makes you want to pray, you know where to start. And that starts with confession. And the good news, the hope you have is because you are healed in Christ and he bore your sins on his body, because he said it is finished, glorious news. You and I do not have to earn or merit or husband our way back to God hearing our prayers. <laughs> All we do is rely upon his great mercy and thank him for his love shown to us in Christ Jesus. And you know you have a merciful and faithful high priest who is ready to carry your burdens of your confessions and your weakness that you're admitting. He's ready to heal you and carry that to the Father, you say. And so we pray. We pray. And though verse 12 says this, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. You need to remember and understand that it's in Christ that you are righteous. And we sang of that together. I'll end with this. Now the curse, it has been broken. Jesus paid the price for me. Full the pardon he has offered. Great the welcome I receive. Boldly I approach my Father, clothed, in Jesus' righteousness. There is no more guilt to carry because it was finished upon the cross. Go to the Lord. I'm going to give you all time to, for silent prayer. Husbands, this is a great time to reach over, grab your wife's hand if she's next to you, and pray silently. Let's take a moment to just seek His grace. Lord, all of us have failed to love as we ought to love in the body of Christ. All of us have failed to show greater honor, bestow greater respect and honor and value those, Lord, who aren't as public as myself, aren't as upfront. Oh, Lord, cleanse us of this and help us, God, to, as a body, cherish each other, honor each other, Lord, equally. Care for one another with the love of Christ. We have already prayed, Lord, uh, as Pedro prayed for our marriages. I pray, Lord, especially again for husbands, for healing, for the capacity to rest in your finished work and move forward in life, knowing, Lord, that this is a lifelong journey. Help us along the way, Lord. Thank you. Hear our prayers because we come clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. 
All of us, Lord, are relying on that, and, and we thank you for your profound mercy in our lives. As an expression of our gratitude, Lord, now we bring our gifts, our offerings as we finish this time together. We pray you help us to be cheerful, grateful, sacrificial givers, and help those families and individuals, Lord, for whom this is a difficult time financially. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, if you're visiting with us, you heard me pray there for our offerings, and this is part of our weekly worship. We express our gratitude to God, and you know, one of the reasons we do it publicly and openly is because this is a way of teaching the next generation. Uh, there's children among us, young people among us, and if everything was done silently, you know, across the internet, you know, zealot me this or this and that, they would never see that sacrifice and giving as part of our public worship with God. So that's one of the reasons we do it. Now, if you're visiting with us, you're a visitor, you're our guest. Thank you for being here. You can do however you like in your heart, but we would ask you to fill out that visitor card. That'd be helpful for us to know how we can pray for you and follow up with you. So drop that in your offering. Let's sing an offering song as we finish our time together.